I want to start off by saying thank you to our industry partners. Thank you for uh, what you do and what you have done. Today we have the most dominant Air Force the world's ever seen, and a large part that's done by a lot of the great work by the people uh, who are airmen within Air Force Materiel Command, but a lot of that has to do with our partnerships with industry because you have to work with us to make that happen, and we greatly appreciate that partnership, and thanks for being here to help keep us going. I was told that I had 40 minutes to talk. I will tell you that will not happen. Uh, there is no way that I will go for 40 minutes, so I do encourage you to be prepared with questions. I'll open it up as soon as I get done. If there are media folks here, I would ask that you hang on to your questions because you get me for 40 minutes after this in a round table, so I would ask that the uh, folks that are attending get the first shots at the questions and uh, feel free to fire away wherever realizing I may or may not be give you, able to give you a great answer because Tomorrow is three weeks in the J-O-B. So I am the new guy, and uh, last night for the first time we slept in our bed in our house, so that's a good thing. Uh, we uh, still don't have any pictures on the wall, but uh, we're happy to be in the seat and uh, in the house and uh, up and running. Um, for all the men and women here from, and airmen from Air Force Materiel Command, I said it at my Assumption of Command, and I want you to hear it again. Caroline and I are absolutely thrilled to get the opportunity to work for you. Uh, we never in a gazillion years believed we would get this opportunity, and we feel truly blessed to get the chance to serve in this role and work for and with you uh, as we do our critical mission. So uh, I uh, am fully committed to working for you, helping you, helping us succeed, because I know you're the ones doing the hard work. It's not going to be me with the stars sitting up in the office. My job is to help you, and I can only do that if I know what you need, and you can uh, elaborate on what I need to do to help you. Um, one of the things, what I'm going to do today, I'm going to uh, talk for just a few minutes about why I think Air Force Material Command is so important. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that are going to carry over that are initiatives that I learned about and worked when I was in the five-sided building. And I know that we're going to work here, but I will probably take them in a slightly different direction because the role that I have today is different than the role that I had uh, a few weeks ago. I firmly believe and have sent in emails to the secretary and the chief and to the other MAGCOM commanders that Air Force Materiel Command is the most important major command in the United States Air Force if we are going to execute the national defense strategy and if we are going to drive to the Air Force we need. If we are not successful in executing our mission, the Air Force cannot be successful in achieving those goals and those expectations that they have set out. That is to let the men and women of Air Force Material Command understand just how important I believe what you do each and every day is to this nation and how we drive forward. If you read the National Defense Strategy, it will tell you that we were in a competition, and we are. The technological advantage that we have enjoyed over the past decades has, is rapidly closing, or in some cases, has closed. Our potential adversaries are uh, adopting many of the technologies that we have used for years through various means, and they are adapting their defenses to make it harder for us to employ air power. They are innovating, and they are rapidly developing their warfighting expertise so that they will be more formidable. We have to respond to that. If you read that National Defense Strategy, it will tell you that we must fill technology at the speed of relevance, that we must be faster and smarter, that we must maintain that technological advantage, that we must improve our readiness, that we must strengthen our partnerships and increase our allies and partners, that we must be a driving force for innovation, that we must provide a credible and reliable nuclear deterrent. 
And that uh, unstated in there, though, is another one that I think is equally critical, and that's that we must provide a safe and productive environment for our airmen across the Air Force and their families if we wish to retain our most valuable resource, which is our men and women that work in Air Force Material Command and in the Air Force. If you listen to what I talked about with readiness and the nuclear deterrent and sustaining an aging force and keeping a technology advantage, none of those can be done without Air Force Material Command. We are driving the driving force in each and every one of those areas. That, ladies and gentlemen, for those who are in Air Force Material Command, is why you are so important and why what you do each and every day is so critical. If you listen to our chief talk, Joe Goldfein will say that we don't know when the next engagement with an adversary will be, but we know that we have until then to get ready. Your efforts each and every day drive that readiness so that we are better prepared and we will be able to, to do what I call our real sacred duty, which is send America's sons and daughters in with the best technology and the best capabilities that we can when we ask them to go do that mission. That's what we do. We do our wartime mission every day. That's why it's so critical that we keep that focus. And that's why it's so critical that as uh, airmen of Air Force Material Command, we continue to be committed to that mission and we, committed, we remain committed to working it with that sense of urgency and diligence. That's what we are called upon to do. Our nation is relying on us to build the Air Force we need far into the future so that we are, remain the most lethal and dynamic force the world has ever seen. Now, that's the charge to the men and women of Air Force Material Command. What I'll say, I'll hearken back to what I said to our industry partners when we started. That was a thank you. We're gonna need to partner with you if we're gonna execute that. We can't do it alone within Air Force Material Command. We need your help in many of the avenues if we are gonna go faster. We are gonna need your help as we try to sustain aging fleets and we deal with a decreasing industrial base. Those are the things that we need industry's partnership with as we move forward. And we look forward to doing that. You've been great partners. We know you're committed to the nation's defense and we look forward to working with you on those areas as we go forward. So now what I'm gonna do is talk about a couple of the areas that I see as uh, pretty significant to go forward with. I will tell you that the first thing that I need to be 100% clear on is that I do not know everything that's going on in Air Force Material Command. I need to listen, and as Joel Goldfein says, I need to squint with my ears. I need to listen to what the men and women of this command say are their needs, where they see our shortfalls, and where they see their challenges. And I'll be honest, I haven't been able to do that yet. Uh, the journey around the, all the locations and sites starts about the second or third week of July, and then we'll go out and about and we'll talk with all those folks with me one-on-one. -on -one. So I will say this is not an all-inclusive list. I will tell you some of these will be re-vectored after I get feedback, but I'll tell you where my initial thoughts are for some of the activities that I believe we're going to need to do as we move forward if we really want to be able to achieve what the nation wants us to do. First one is going to be digital engineering. We are going to have to create an environment where we can use digital engineering across the life cycle of our platforms. Many people look at digital engineering and a great example of what we're doing right now, if you go look at what uh, Sean Morris and the team on ground-based strategic deterrent are doing, they created a model-based systems engineering thing, they've been able to run multiple trades, they've been able to do a lot of stuff, that's a great step. When I talk about digital engineering, what I'm talking about is that plus more. I want us to be able to create the models so that I can take the data that we collect in the wind tunnel, the data that we collect in our early test runs, the data that the contractor produces as we do producibility, the data that we collect through the test program, continue to feed all that back through so that we have a digital representation of what the platforms are that are out there. 
By doing that, we will then be able to modernize at a more rapid rate. We will be able to minimize the time it takes to test, maybe even in some cases eliminate testing, and we'll be able to make smart trades for where we see the business case analysis going. We also, though, as part of this, have to create an environment where all of that is secure, where that we can rapidly transmit data back and forth, and where that we develop our engineering community and arm them with the tools so that they can make that useful. That is an area, though, that I believe we're going to have to get better if we're going to go faster. The other one you're going to continue to see us push is on the rapid sustainment office and the activities they've undertaken. We've only dipped our toe into the capability of that organization. And we're going to have to do a lot more with our aging fleet. We're modernizing a lot of things within the Air Force right now. But if you look at the trend line, particularly with our tactical aviation, the age number still continues to go up. We are not buying aircraft yet at the rate new to turn the curve and drive that we are getting younger with our tactical aviation fleet. We're going to have to sustain that fleet. There are a large, par a large portion of those parts that we're asking to be repaired where we have sole source. There are a lot of those that are now that are components in many of our, much of our inventory because of the age and the technology has moved on where they're coming back with no bids. We have to work with Gene Kirkland and with the Robert on the Rapid Sustainment Office and that team. We have to find a way to create the industry base and make it where it is worthwhile for people to come into that area and invest. We're going to be keeping a lot of these airplanes around for quite a while and we need to create an industrial base that can support that. We also, though, have to be, go into it eyes wide open with what it's going to take to actually achieve what we want with things like conditions-based maintenance. There's great, pro great promise there for what we can do, but there's an investment we need to make on the front end to be able to reap those rewards, and we've got to tell that story and get the Air Force to buy into it. So that's another area that I think you're going to see us continue to push an area that we will continue to be looking for help as we look at technologies that can help us in those areas. Another one I'll talk about is you're going to continue to see us push for open mission systems. Uh, we are going to have to do that if we want to do faster and we want to be more relevant. We have that in some platforms. We do not have it in everything. Dr. Roper and I at a meeting that we were both at probably two weeks ago we're discussing how do we put a timeline on this for all of our MDSs? How do we put this for all of our mission uh, aircraft that we have a timeline that we're going to march to open mission systems so that we can modernize those as technology changes in a more rapid manner? Uh, we're going to continue to put that in our request, request for proposal, and we're going to continue to work that way so that we can bring new technologies in quicker. Uh, Cybersecurity. If you're an industry partner and you're not worried about cybersecurity, you need to be. Um, if it's important enough that our, our uh, Secretary Shanahan, when he was the uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense and then he carried it forward when he went to be the SecDef, formed a protecting critical technology, cyber technologies type. Protecting Critical Technologies Task Force. That was focused on how do we protect our critical technologies from exfiltration by adversaries? What mechanisms do we put in place? How do we work with industry? What safeguards do we have? How do we get this out to small businesses and newly formed companies so that we can protect their ideas? I recently had someone talk to me who had an innovative idea in the area of artificial intelligence. I said they were getting multiple calls per day from Chinese companies trying to buy them out so that they could buy that technology and move forward. How do we create an environment where we can protect those critical technologies and we understand how we need to do that? How do we protect the weapon systems that we have today? 
Many of you have heard me use the example of the B-52, which I flew. I'm pretty sure in 1964, that's the date I was told, when the last one rolled off the line, Boeing was not worried about cybersecurity. I feel confident in saying that. But today, when you count up everything else that we've added to that platform, the cyber footprint and the cyber surface that we have to protect is much larger. And we have to find ways to make smart investments to protect those areas that we believe are the most vulnerable. That's an area where we're also, though, in the role as the AFMC commander, I have to make sure that we are recruiting, hiring, retaining the right cyber expertise, which is all of us, government and industry, are fighting for to be able to carry out that mission for the United States Air Force. That is a key area that I will have to work and one that I will have to be worried about. Software. Uh, you have seen us stand up, Kessel Run. We have two other software factories in the Air Force right now that we have stood up. One I think we call Kobayashi Maru out in the Space and Missile Systems Center under J.T. Thompson. And we're standing up another one right now down at Gunter under Rich Aldridge. I think we're calling that one B-SPIN, but I may not have that acronym exactly right. Best spin got it. Somebody up here, much smarter than me, corrected me to 100%. Thank you very much for that. Those are great ideas. Those are great things that we're going to be able to go do, and we're showing great promise in those. But what we have to do if we're going to do this, we have to recruit, we have to hire, we have to retain those individuals. In the organized, train, and equip role for Air Force Materiel Command, we have to create an environment where those individuals are constantly working with the latest state of the art. We have to always be innovating and rapidly uh, bringing up the industry standards, what they're working on, and we have to create an educational program so that we can get them up to speed constantly with what's the latest in commercial practices. That is going to be a challenge with our budget environment that we work in. But that's the challenge that I get to uh, work with Robert and with Gene Kirkland. And I say with Gene Kirkland because Gene has software factories at each of the, uh, the logistics complexes that are doing simply phenomenal work, and we have to be able to find a way to keep those going and keep those running at a high rate. The other one that we have to do here is create an environment where our officer and enlisted corps can contribute to this in ways they have not done in the past. The example I use for this is a young man that briefed me uh, at a uh, AFRL uh, day at the five-sided building. And I talked to this young man, and he's a second lieutenant, and he is briefing me on something that he has done, and he's showing me a display of how he is taking information from three different sources, merging it in, putting it in a very graphical image that he can use, making it very user-friendly even for a knuckle-dragger like me, and it gave an accurate picture of what was going on, and it was very communicative. And I asked him, I said, so where did you get your computer or software degree from? He goes, oh, no, sir. My degree is in uh, you know, physics or whatever else it was. And I said, so how did you get this? Did you do a contractor, or what did you do? He said, oh, no, I was interested in this, and I went and bought the books, and I taught myself the coding, and I taught myself how to go do this. And it hit me then that we have people that love coding software. What we are talking about now, and I have talked about with the other MAGCOM commanders is, how do I take your F-15, F-15E weapon system operator who loves to code software out of the cockpit bring them to work on Kessel Run or something else, or manage a program that's acquisition, that's software, and let them work for a couple, three years without derailing their career? Or how do I go get the young enlisted troop working on a flight line at Nellis Air Force Base and bring them down the gunner and let them code for two or three years without ruining their career and allowing them to grow? Those are the discussions right now that we're having at the four-star level. How do we capitalize on the human capital that we have and the, the expertise we have? 
Do we do that through counting the certs that people have and allowing them to be coded so that they can go do that? We do, do we do this along the lines of how we do language testing within the government now in the military where you put a DDAP score on there and it shows somebody's propensity to learn? And how fast can you move them back and forth and how can you use them? If we're going to be successful at doing this and coding within the government, those are the kind of things we have to go look at. We also, though, have to find a way to go and recruit in a very dynamic environment, meaning we have to give them great things to go do, we have to empower them to go try those things, and we have to continue to challenge them so that they grow with their skill set. If we don't continue to update and modernize the facilities and, the package and what they're working on, they will no longer be competitive, and they will no longer be at the state-of-the-art level and we will not be as effective or efficient as we need to be. Defense Digital Services in my previous role said if you're not giving, if you're not updating their skill set and they're not operating at that level and actually doing coding on the latest things, within 18 months they're no longer state of the art and they're no longer relevant. And you've got to put them back through another spin cycle. Which is why I am asking right now, how much are we investing in updating all of our labs on a recurring basis? How are we going to do this in the corporate process to make sure that we're ready for the future and that we're able to uh, explain to everybody what we're doing? So software, big deal. If you haven't thought about it a whole lot, or if you don't believe I thought about that one just a little bit, hopefully the dialogue lets you know that one's on the radar screen and one we're going to have to go work across the entire enterprise. Okay, adaptive basing. Okay, this is one that the Air Force Installation and Mission Support Center is working. If you look overseas at where we're at, a lot of our basing in, uh, in USAFE and a lot of those areas has dwindled down. We have a smaller footprint in a lot of those places. We're going to have to figure out how we can drop in an adaptive base, project power out into areas, utilize it for a period of time, and then pull back. We're going to have to figure out how to go do that. How do you get the power that you need at the locations? How do you set up the networking that you need? What kind of support equipment do you need? Do you, multi, multi, uh, do you cross skill and train individuals to be able to work that? How do you get the uh, base in a box down to a size that you can land it, set it up, do it, and then leave? Those are all, are all areas that we're going to be doing additional exploration in, experimentation, and exercises to go see what we can do and take the lessons we're learning through a series of experiments that we've run thus far, particularly with things like F-35, and figure out how we're going to do that in the future as that force grows and becomes bigger and bigger. S&T 2030. Many of you, if you're an industry partner and you haven't read the strategy, I would encourage you to go read the strategy. Uh, Bill Cooley and, uh, and Air Force Superior Command Leadership are working right now to plan to implement what's in the S&T 2030 strategy. How do we most efficiently and effectively utilize the dollars that are there? How do we optimize the value we get out of our basic research by, by using academia and drawing them in? And how do we create that competitive environment for ideas that may want to be vanguard programs for the future? If you read the strategy, we talk about vanguard programs and having a certain number of those and moving budget around to support those. Those are going to be ideas we're going to look for industry as well as internal to the government to come up with. Can't tell you exactly how that process is working. Bill's supposed to be doing that in early July, and I'm not stealing his thunder. But that's a process that we're developing and working our way through right now and uh, is where the Air Force wants to go and we'll be supporting that. So that's going to be another big focus area in the future here. Another one that I kind of talked about with the Rapid Sustainment Office, that's our aircraft availability improvement efforts. We as a department with the aging fleet to improve readiness have got to continue to focus on how do we make more aircraft available. We're doing regular meetings that we are the chair for. I got to do the first one of those as the AFMC commander just a couple of days ago. Uh, we're going to continue to do those and look for ideas that will allow us to, be, to generate more aircraft to improve the readiness so that we can get more pilots trained, 
to address the pilot retention problems. It all ties together for what we need to be able to do to, do to be the Air Force we need uh, for the future. Test. Joe Holmes, myself, Joe Ray, and General Miller are all talking about how we test for the future. How do we do more combined tests? How do we do DTOT at the same time and get it all signed off so that we can get things done faster? I am very focused on that area. But I am also very focused on one of the earlier things that I talked about from a test perspective. How do I change or how do we change or adopt the way that we test to get to where we're doing more in the agile software way and I'm not having to go through the dedicated period of developmental test and then operational test. We're doing some pilots in that area. That's working out pretty well. We're going to take those lessons and apply them farther out. This is one that we cannot do internally to the Air Force alone. This is one that we will have to have dot and &E sign up to, the operational test community sign up to. It may change how we have to uh, structure where we're located in some places. All of those are activities that we've got to do if we're going to be faster and smarter and we're going to get the capabilities out there faster. It's going to change in some ways a mindset to what industry does. I mean, one of the things we did in my previous JOB was we actually went to Silicon Valley with a group of testers and we took uh, them out. We took TE, we took uh, the Air Force Test Center, we took Affitech, we took dot and &E, and we took others and we all went to Silicon Valley to go see how are you testing your software and how are you pushing it out and what would we need to adapt or adopt in our methodology so that we can do that in a more timely manner. Those are all ones that we are looking at. I can't tell you how that's going to play out. I will tell you that it is a focus area for uh, everybody so that we can do the faster and smarter because that's all got to be part of the equation for what we're trying to do. One of the things that uh, we are going to have to look at, and I kind of skipped this, so I apologize. As we look at our aircraft availability programs and we look at what we need to do for the future, of our sustainment of our fleet, we have optimized our sustainment center. And if you look at the art of the possible, we have optimized that around efficiency. We have optimized it around every dollar and tracking every dollar and squeezing absolutely everything out of that that we can. That is good and we need to continue to focus on cost savings. The one piece though that that takes out is surge capability and it takes out some resiliency and it takes out some effectiveness that we may need if we needed to surge. That is another area that we are discussing with A4. That's something that we are trying to figure out. How do you balance what you do with the budget to have some resiliency and effectiveness and some surge capacity? in the midst of a budget where you're trying to make every dollar count and invest as much as you can and advance the lethality of the force. With that, I will pause and I will open it to whoever wants to fire the first shot. Go. Go. Yep. Okay, so the question for those that didn't hear that was there's a contract mechanism and how can industry come in with ideas to go forward to experiment with some things. So I think the way we do that is I, any good ideas flow them into AFIMSC and into Brad Spacey's team and flow them into the A4 community so that we can weigh them out. I think we are going to be competing for experimentation dollars and those ideas get flowed up through AFWIC, the Air Force, Air Force Warfighting Integration Capability or Center, whichever one of those two the C stands for. 
and we're going to weigh those out, and we're going to throw experimentation dollars at ideas. I know that's one that's on everybody's radar screen right now based off of the work that we're doing in our uh, planning. What else? Go. Not on. Okay. It is on. Check. It is. Check. Okay, there it is. So you talked about uh, speed of relevance and digital engineering and adaptive uh, basing and even adaptive contracting. How does that vision get translated all the way down to the source selection criteria? Because that's not necessarily how we're awarding contracts today. It's a great question. And I think it's a dialogue that we have to put as we get ready to start our programs and we gotta get the right people involved up front to make sure that's a factor we're considering. The part that we have to communicate in that area is, if you're gonna do the digital engineering, kinda like open mission systems, if you're gonna do that, there's a cost up front. And we have to convince everybody that that's worth the investment up front to drive what we're gonna save in the future. So that'll be a task that we have to take on as I work with the other MAGCOM commanders to explain the value across all of the parts of Air Force Materiel Command and how they can invest a little now and reap the, benefit, the benefits of that in the long term, that's part of the message that we gotta get going forward. I will tell you that today, right before I left to come here, I got an email from a four star that said, I wanna digitize this platform, I wanna make the investments now, I wanna use it as a trial case for what we do on all the other platforms so that we can move forward in a more rapid manner and be more effective with what we're trying to do. That tells me that the four stars are at least thinking along the, right, the proper lines of what we've got to do for the future. Right there, sorry ma'am. They're trying to get to you behind you. Um, sir, in, in today's environment, you talked about um, this balancing the model-based engineering needs, needs for speed, need for you know more, well, and I'll say more digital seed rolls going forward, and cyber. How do we balance that with, you know, unfortunately our, our slow networks, I consider right now we're, we have such a inefficiency issues there. Uh, it seems like we're building the right infrastructures to create model-based engineering, but we've got to get those uh, the networks to actually work for us. So. Okay, so what was the, th you said something about seed rules that I missed. It, that, that I inserted that we need to have digital seed rules uh, oh, being okay. delivered. All right. And so all that has to be with ne right networks. So Thanks. when I said we have to create the right environment for that to be secure, and we have to create the right infrastructure for that to happen, you did not miss it, that is exactly the area that I am trying to hit at. Uh, I was wondering if General McMurray planted that question because the thing that he, uh, I refer to it as you bang on your high chair like a spoiled kid until somebody pays attention to you. Robert frequently bangs on his high chair about the network and the poor performance. Uh, one of the initiatives that we have going on right now that uh, Gunny is actually working, and I got an update on just a couple of days ago. We're trying to move to enterprise IT as a service. What we're actually trying to do is go to where we're using more commercial activities and more along the lines of commercial and looking at the cloud and looking at other things so that we can pass the data in a timely manner. We do have the up that we need, we, the uptime that we need, and we don't have the latency which is killing us in a lot of areas. So it is not one that is lost. I will tell you that the acting secretary is very focused on enterprise IT as a service and digital air force. So everything that I just told you is in line with where he is driving. And we've got to get these pilots out there and see how they perform. And then we will look to broaden that out. I think we have three, ba three contracts that are experiments right now. And as those go forward, we, the air force are talking about how much do we need to keep putting into this to go out farther and farther and make it to where it's better for everybody in the Air Force? That's the best answer I can give you right now. It's on everybody's radar screen and we're working it feverishly. What else? Yes, sir. Coming to you on your, on your right. 
we've talked a lot about improving our network and EIT as a service, but when I ask Gunny the question, are you funded? So we are funded for, um, you're, you're asking a great question. Uh, one of the things that uh, some of us had to have told people within the Air Force is, this is a regular recurring bill you just got to put the money in for. It's going to be a gift that just keeps coming because you've got to have it. So I would say that we are funded at the level that we need to execute through the next year, and it's a discussion that's going on in the corporate process now as to how we play it out for the remainder. It is definitely one that we are having the debate on, and that was discussed at Corona at the highest levels just a few weeks back. Okay, you can't give my fellow Tennessee Bubba Mobile more than you gave. I mean, I, I hear you guys pummeled him with all kinds of questions. Um, we talked a lot about agility when it comes to moving fast so that innovative companies will be willing to work with us. But when it comes to our HR process, we don't have the speed that innovative people want to work for us. People don't want to sit around and wait for four months for their job offer to come through. Are there any efforts afoot um, to make AFPC more agile? <laughs> Great question. Nope. If you will note, one of the things that I said when I talked about what we needed to do in software, we needed to be able to recruit, we needed to be able to hire, that's a time factor. So what I would say is Mr. Snodgrass, who's up on the A1 uh, for AFMC, he and the team are leading a lot of efforts. We've done some job fair type things where we've given jobs on site. We've got direct hire authority for certain activities and we're demonstrating that those can go and we're looking for ways to use that more. Um, so there are efforts to go at this and attack it. We realize that we're in a position that if we can't make offers in a timely manner, people need to put food on the table and other people, if they're particularly skilled, are gonna be willing to go do things. So we're actively doing that. The other one that we're doing is we're actively using a big uh, intern program that started. I, I got the email just last night on how many people are coming to the uh, intern summit that we're having. It's a bigger number than anybody else in the Air Force. So we're trying to use intern programs to get people in that would lead them to, then lead to them coming into the government and working and doing it in a more timely manner. We have to be able to get them in. The other one that we have to continue to work, open kimono here, we gotta to continue to work the security clearance process. There's nobody that wants to come in and then go sit off in a corner for six to eight months waiting on the security clearance to come through. So that's the other one. Now that just came back to the government, uh, to the Department of Defense from other parts of the government that is now pinned on us to try to do that. That one I will tell you is briefed monthly or every other month at the air staff on how are we driving the numbers down and the backlogs. So it's, it's how do we bring them in the door? It's how do we get them their security clearance? It's how to create an environment where they want to stay. And one of the ones that I'm starting to think about but I don't have enough on it yet that I can move how does our reward and award system support the generation that we're bringing into the workplace now? Today, we have a very diverse workforce from an age demographics perspective. We had a lady at Edwards Air Force Base, May the 30th, uh, Pat Henrich, retired. 68 years of service as a government civilian. What she finds rewarding, probably different than the young graduate out of Purdue that I'm hiring in right now, maybe a little different, maybe a little different in the communication area, maybe a little different in what they want from a workplace. We gotta look at as our system and the way that our personnel system is set up, gonna be able to allow us to reward and award them as well. So, when I talk about the challenge of that, hiring is just one aspect that's on my radar screen. 
I believe you've got to look at that whole spectrum or we're going to lose them. I believe it also goes into what I talked about is the unwritten part of the national defense strategy and a part that not everybody realizes AFMC plays such a key role in. We have to create a work environment and a comm infrastructure and everything associated with that that's competitive with industry or we're going to lose people. We have to do it not only for the airmen, but we also have to do it for their families or we're not going to retain them. And every time we lose one of those that we've trained and we got security clearance and everything else, it takes money, time, and energy to get that back. And we've got to create that environment, and AFIMSC plays a key role in that for the entire Air Force, not just for what we're doing within AFMC. Very long answer to a very short question. I apologize. But hopefully you understand it is one I'm thinking a little bit about. What else? Yes, sir. Gillis West, um, Tangram Flex. So nine priorities a lot. On Those aren't team. all priorities. Those okay. just areas we're going to go work. But anyone stand out to you as being most critical as far as giving your, your attention and time to? My first attention and time, I'll give you the first couple of three things that I'm focused on. I am focused right now on listening. Okay? Um, the line that I use with the center commanders uh, on the Saturday morning session, yes, I had a Saturday morning session with all the center commanders after I took command on Friday. I'm really happy that they were willing to come in and spend that time with me on Saturday morning. It was kind of optionally mandatory, but they were there. Uh, none of us is as smart as all of us. I need to listen. I am not the fount of all knowledge. I need to understand what the team believes we need to go work on so that I can do it. That's number one. There are a couple of areas, if you read my bio, that I have not spent as much time. I have not spent as much time working in AFIMSC. I am not as familiar with the installation and mission sports center roles and what they do. And I am not as familiar with what we do within the Air Force Sustainment Center. I have already informed those folks that they're going to get more love than me initially. Uh, so that I can understand that mission set and bring my knowledge level up to where I can adequately argue for their positions and articulate the mission that they have. That doesn't mean I don't love, and I, and I truly mean this, some of you will kind of roll your eyes and uh, whatever. I love all the people, all the men and women in Air Force Material Command. Okay? There are going to be times during my tenure I may not like some of them, uh, but I will love them all. Right now, there are a few that are going to get a little more love right off the bat so that I can level base my knowledge and be better prepared to go out. Once we go through that and I get inputs from the field and understand areas and I take the knowledge that I bring from what I've done in Air Force Material Command, which is a little bit, and what I learned out of the uh, AQ MILDEP job, then we'll set some higher priorities and figure out where we're going to go. So if I came today and told you, Here's step one, step two, step three, step four. You, you should roll your eyes and go, he, so I, I'm not there. What I'm giving you is what I got to do to get my knowledge base up to the right point to start off with. Okay? Yes, sir. Go, Abel. General, Abel Carrillo, SML for HNC. As we go faster and we become more agile as acquisition professionals, the closer it brings us to our operators, uh, we've spent a lot of time at this, uh, these sessions talking about being coming closer with the contractor. At the same time this is happening, our contractors and our operators are getting closer and there's some changes in the roles, uh, material solution decisions between other MAGCOM commanders and combatant commanders. Interested in your perspective on those relationships, sir? Yeah, so uh, by the way, can you take that picture down? You should not have to look at that bald cranium that long. I'm really sorry about that. I just realized that was up there. Um, thank you. That's much better. Uh, it's farther away. It's not as zoomed in, so I'm good with that. Uh, so, um, Abel, that's a great point. Uh, I, this is an area that I've talked with the MAGCOM commanders about since I got in the JOB. Um, when I was in the B-1 program office, when Major Bunch worked in the B-1 program office, we had an air combat command individual sitting in the program office with us. We would go to that individual on a regular basis, and we'd go, hey, we're thinking about doing this. Can you go find some information out? 
And the other thing that we had in the program offices, and I see Rich Knoll back there, he did this with me. Uh, thank God for not firing me, Rich. Thank you very much. Um, we had like three or four or five operators in the program office. People that had flown aircraft or done that mission set. We had that pretty much across the whole spectrum of any of our program offices. Today we don't have that. With the rated shortages we've got, we've lost that ability. We no longer have as close of a tie in some cases. So what Joe Holmes and myself have talked about and what we're talking about, I will talk about with some of the other, I've talked with some of the match companies, but I'll do more of it. Do we want to tie a wing with some of our program offices so that we can exchange information and have dialogues? So do I want to take an F-15E wing and tie it to what's going on in Heath Collins' portfolio relative to the F-15? Do I want to have that kind of an exchange and a dialogue so that we're more closely aligned and we better understand and we have someone that we can bounce ideas off of? Um, or do I need to take a C-17 unit and align it to Linda so that they can have some dialogue? Now, there's some danger with that. There's a lot of danger with that. Uh, you got to make clear rules in the road as to what they can speak for the MAGCOM for or what they can't speak for the MAGCOM for because they could easily draft some things that the MAGCOM commander may not think are that important. So it's not one I want to step into trivially, but I do believe we have separated a little bit in some cases from that because we don't have the presence in the program offices, and I believe we need to continue to strengthen that. So that may not have been exactly what you asked, but that's kind of where my thoughts are right now. Yes, sir. Go. Yes, sir. As we have thoughts and ideas, how do we get those to you, sir? So, um, <laughs> staff's going to hate this. I'm in the global. Um, I'm in the global network for my email address, so they can come VFR direct to me if you want them to. Uh, we're going to, uh, we have ways through our FMC website that people can put ideas in. We have ways within the centers. If you have ideas, I would say get them to whatever program office you work with, and they'll get bubbled up so that we can consider. Okay? I want to keep that door open and make it as available as possible. What else? So I've got to tell a story on Holmes. He's not here to defend himself. So he and I are testifying in Congress. One of those fun things you get to do when you're the mill dep in AQ and he gets to do when he's the A58, and we always went together. And we testified in Congress, it was one of my first times going over there, and I do my opening remarks. And General Holmes proceeds with, well, Congressman, General Bunch and I grew up about 45 minutes away from each other. His accent's not quite as strong as mine. And he says, we can't figure out if everybody back home is absolutely scared to death that we're sitting here in front of you today or if they're really proud. <laughs> so I looked over at him. That was totally a surprise to me that that was coming out. And I thought, dear God, we better hit this out of the park or we're going to be really getting ridiculed by a lot of different folks. So any last minute ones? Open shots. Go, Kathy. Right here. Yes, ma'am. So from your last J-O-B, any insights on the outlook for the FY20 budget? For the FY20 budget. Um, I believe we've done a good job articulating where we're at. I believe we're going to have some engagements based on the marks that we've seen that we're going to continue to do. What I would say is I uh, believe we'll start, at least what I'm hearing is, we may start under a continued resolution that may run for quite some time, and we'll have to posture ourselves to be able to support that. Um, but I believe most of the big things that we were trying to push for in that uh, have gone over reasonably well, and I think we're in a pretty reasonable place. Uh, Budget Control Act, that's a dialogue I haven't really had. That's one that we have... If you, uh, you can also, I found out, Google this. If you go back and look at what I testified in front of the SAS this year, uh, the airline, you will see that I told them that if they go into the Budget Control Act and a CR, that it'll be completely devastating for us. 
and that we will lose any of the gains that we had in readiness and it will set us back dramatically. So it's one that we've tried to sound the alarms on. We'll have to see what comes out. Yeah, Robert. So from where you came, yep. you, you very clearly, you had plenty of time from the nomination start process <laughs> to the arrival time to think about you know, things. So from the perspective of the, of the acquisition execution arm of the Air Force, what, what were you thinking you, you really wanted out of the, 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 when you were sitting there, what did you want from AFMC that now you're saying, well, maybe not, or now that you're saying definitely I've got to do beyond what you've already talked about? So uh, great question. Um, so the ones that I know that I have to go work based on what I saw then and what I go now, I got to work people. The reality of it is our, pers our airmen, uh, I don't, uh, you're going to note kind of a change in the way that we talk about this. Um, all the men and women that work in Air Force Material Command are airmen. I'm not going to talk tremendously about the civilian workforce or the military workforce. To me, we're all airmen. Everybody's committed to the mission. We have a dedicated civilian workforce that's poured their heart and souls into this. They're completely dedicated to what we do. And I see no reason to distinguish between such. So if you take offense by that as a civilian, you can come hit me later. Uh, I believe we're all airmen working for a common cause of getting capability out to the field. Okay, so you're going to note that. I think the most important part I got to go work is I got to work airmen. I got to make sure we are recruiting, hiring, retaining, rewarding, awarding the right folks. I know we're short in a lot of areas. We got to look at how we can optimize those people to be successful, uh, and I think we got to do that. Um, I know that we have facility issues in a lot of areas that are within AFL-CMC and within the sustainment center and within the test center and within AFRL and I'm sure Sean's got them but he hadn't told me about them yet so I know I got a lot of that but I also got to go work. Those are ones I heard about there that I listened and I know I got to continue to go do. Um, <clears throat> I got to create the... I. I there's nothing really that I've changed my position on from being there that I would say I'm not going to go do now that I'm in this seat. Uh, there are a lot, of, I'll be honest, when your confirmation process goes as long as mine did, um, you have to have a lot of dialogue with your former boss about things that he wants to partner on. One of the things that he has said he wants to see differently is he wants me to be more aware and involved with a lot of the acquisition stuff going on. I don't know exactly how we're going to make that work, uh, but I know that he is. Uh, he says he's sent an email out to all the program executive officers to keep me on all the email trail for the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and I, I don't know if he's done that or not. I'm telling you that's what he told me he wanted to go do. Uh, but he wanted to keep that partnership going forward and he wanted to keep a closer relationship as we work people things. So a lot of those we're going to, how we train and educate our software developers and our coders, that's another one that's in the forefront of uh, his cranium and one that we will take on and we'll have to go work as a match comp. So I don't see anything where I've dramatically flip-flopped overnight stepping in. Any last minute ones? Yes, ma'am. A re-attack. Go for it. <clears throat> Sir, as you're talking about your, our HR issues, um, specifically from my perspective, we've had, um, we've had the, uh, starting to hire people who can help us with the AI arena and help us leapfrog. A and in doing so in reviewing resumes, the majority of the most qualified, most experienced people that could help us leapfrog were not, did not have a degree. And these non-degree people are superb, but our system and our HR system is not able to accept them and, and nor compensate them, as you said, to not only acquire them, but retain them. Uh, so that's also uh, a, a challenge in the HR area that perhaps you might okay. consider. Valid, got it. I'll, uh, that's not one that I had on the radar screen, but one I can add. Anybody else? Okay, let me uh, end with kind of what I started with. For our industry partners, 
Thank you. Um, we talk about what we need to change. We talk about how we got to get better. We talk about all those things. Please don't lose track of the fact that we are the most dominant Air Force the world has ever known. Okay? We, we should be proud of the work that we've done to reach this. Now the challenge with industry and everybody is we have to sustain it and we have to continue it. So it's not, oh, woe is me. We've done a remarkable job. Thank you for that partnership. For the men and women of AFMC, what you do every day is important. It is critically important to this nation's defense. It's critical, critically important to the national defense strategy. And it's critically important to, if we are going to achieve the Air Force that we need. Please operate with that sense of urgency in what you're doing every day. If you have one week before we were to go to war, what would you do differently? Think about how you're doing your day-to-day -day activities with that mindset, please. Because that's the lens that we need to look at things through to make sure that we are ready. We are thrilled to be here to work for you. We look forward to the partnership. I look forward to learning. And I look forward to serving you as the commander. And you have mine and Caroline's 100% commitment that we're going to pour our hearts and souls into this to make you successful. And thanks for what you do each and every day that makes us successful and keep up the great work. Thanks. General Bunch, thank you very much.